Hello everyone and good evening. My name is Don Arleth and you're watching World News Tonight here on TVP World. Our main story tonight is the 2024 Paris Olympic Games, but it's not the only topic we'll be covering. Let's go ahead right now and look at the latest headlines. A series of fires has hit French high-speed rail lines just hours before the Paris Olympics opening ceremony. Vice President Kamala Harris vows not to be silent about the suffering in Gaza amid the Israeli-Hamas war. And Polish lawmakers approve a bill making it easier for uniformed services to use weapons against migrants on the Belarus border. The opening ceremony of the 2024 Paris Summer Olympic Games is already underway. This year's edition of the world's most iconic sports event is likely to feature several strong Polish performances. The wait is finally over. Following months upon months of preparation, the Polish Olympic team, boasting 100 men and 113 women, is eager to compete. In the weeks ahead of the Games, many Polish fans focused on the men's volleyball team, which is looking to make a comeback following an unexpected early exit during the previous Tokyo Summer Olympics. We will have to prove our superiority in every single game, play to the best of our ability and deliver our best performance. If we succeed, I'm certain we'll win. However, if we play below our capabilities, we still have so much potential, it should be enough to deliver good results and move through the knockout stage. The stakes could not be higher. Athletes from all around the world will compete for Olympic medals, and every single one wants to make their country proud. I think this is the highest honor for every sportsman in the world to be a part of the Olympic team. This is something uh, incredible and I think nobody, nothing it's uh, possible to compare with that. Uh, this is uh, best event in the world and once on the four years you want to be the part of the most important games in the world. Yet it's not just the Polish volleyball team that's feeling the pressure. Experts estimate that Polish athletes could return to their homeland with 16 medals overall. Such a result would signify noticeable progress, as Poland was not able to secure more than 14 medals in any of the 21st century editions of the Summer Games. Some of these medals are likely to be gold, with most expecting WTA leader and Paris champion Iga Świątek to triumph in the single tennis tournament. Apart from Świątek, Polish swimmers are highly motivated too and want to fight for as many golds as possible. The coaching staff is confident that the Poles are capable of winning multiple medals in the swimming events, some of which begin this Saturday. The Games will run until August 11. Until then, the only thing left is to watch and cheer on. France's main high speed rail network ground to a halt on Friday following a series of arson attacks. Hundreds of thousands of passengers were left stranded at train stations right before the opening ceremony of the Paris 2024 Summer Olympic Games. Usually lightning fast and extremely reliable, the French high-speed trains stood frozen at stations across France, paralyzed at arguably the worst possible time, the day of the opening ceremony of the Paris 2024 Olympics. We came through here and then uh, we were waiting on our train and we say at the, saw at the billboards that there is a delay on t 30 minutes. Now it's 40 minutes, so it's getting longer and longer. As many as 800,000 people were affected by the delays caused by a series of arson attacks targeting railway signal boxes linking the French capital to cities like Lille and Bordeaux. We think that the attack was premeditated, calculated and coordinated. I think they really had the intention to cause serious harm, since the areas where these fires were started correspond with rail switches, which means that one fire would affect two destinations. Tourists and Olympic spectators weren't the only ones affected. While most athletes weren't impacted by the delays, sports officials and other members of national teams were. 
Our team, luckily, is already uh, in the Olympic Village uh, and uh, everything is okay. But our board of administration, um, there are three people, they wanted to join us today, uh, especially because tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m. a uh, competition for our men's national team volleyball is starting. But um, now everything uh, stands still and uh, they are not sure if they arrive this evening. French police have opened an investigation into the fires, with the arsonists remaining unknown as of now. And now moving on to the United States, where Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has just, just met with Donald Trump following his meeting with Kamala Harris. Harris portrayed herself as more moderate Israel ally than President Biden which was met with enthusiasm by a large majority of her base. Let's now take a close look into how the issue of U.S.-Israel relations will impact the ongoing race for the White House. Just four days into her presidential campaign, Kamala Harris was thrust into one of the biggest challenges of U.S. foreign policy, the Middle East crisis. Harris snapped Netanyahu's speech in Congress, but met with him privately. And while she reaffirmed U.S. support for Israel, she also stressed the need to put an end to the war and provide aid for Gaza. I've said it many times, but it bears repeating. Israel has a right to defend itself. And how it does so matters. It symbolizes the blood of Joe Biden's unwavering support for Israel caused him to lose support of many Democrat and uncommitted voters. According to a YouGov poll from March, 20% of voters in key battleground states were less likely to vote for Biden due to his stance on Gaza. For years and years and years, generations of Democrats have unquestionably supported Israel. Now, with the younger Democrats, that's completely changing. The Democrats' support for Israel has been falling over the last 20 years, while Republicans grew more sympathetic on the issue. Reflecting this change, Donald Trump has loudly criticized Biden's handling of Gaza war, calling for more decisive support for Israel. During his time in office, Trump moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I also want to thank President Trump for all the things he did for Israel, from recognizing Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, to confronting Iran's aggression, to recognizing Jerusalem as our capital, and moving the American Embassy there. That's Jerusalem our eternal capital, never to be divided again. Trump and Netanyahu had a close relationship until 2020, when the Israeli PM congratulated Biden on his victory. Based on today's meeting, they seem to have patched things over. The ongoing war in Gaza is among the key issues of U.S. foreign policy, and Harris's handling of the matter will certainly play a big role in the election campaign. The latest CNN poll shows Kamala closing in on, but still slightly trailing, Trump. She has, however, just received the endorsement of Michelle and Barack Obama, which will likely be reflected in the next poll. About saying to my girl Kamala, I am proud of you. And of course, as earlier mentioned, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with Donald Trump today and earlier with Kamala Harris. Now, the latter may not have gone as well for Netanyahu as the former. Now let's go to our correspondent in Tel Aviv, Diana Skaya, for the details. Hello, Diana. Now, can you tell us uh, what do we know about these two key meetings with the most likely uh, next president of the United States, either whether that be Donald Trump or Kamala Harris? I love the sound of that, uh, Don. Good evening. Well, uh, as we speak currently, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, along with his wife, Sarah Netanyahu, are uh, Spending a Shabbos at Donald Trump's uh, Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. Um, uh, the meeting there was quite uh, friendly. I mean, the videos that were circulating online showed uh, Donald Trump. I mean, greeting with open arms both uh, Sarah and uh, uh, and the Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu. Uh, clearly saying, of course, you know how good it is to 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 welcome them back. It's been actually uh, about three years that that uh, that both of them actually hadn't spoken uh, up until uh, up until uh, now, particularly after uh, Netanyahu had actually posted a, a tweet condemning uh, the uh, the shooting attack that happened uh, on Donald Trump uh, just uh, just a few uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a few days ago. Now, from what we know, uh, with his uh, with his 
the meeting with Kamala Harris, like we heard in the previous report, I mean, Kamala here, particularly in Israel, her remarks are seen a little bit as controversial because she puts all this focus on the humanitarian aid relief in Gaza. Uh, she put the talk on all of that. However, at the same time, she reaffirmed her position, her pro-Israel stance. Uh, we heard it in this report how, uh, from her own, uh, from her own uh, words, how she said that Israel has the right to defend, uh, has the right to defend itself. She was also the only uh, U.S. official since the beginning of this war who actually uh, said the names of all eight American Israeli hostages still held up in Gaza. Now, of course, that many Israelis here, particularly the far right ministers that took to platform X, uh, lashed out at her, saying also. Uh, Mrs. Candidate, we are not going to end the war, whether there is a ceasefire or not, even though the hostages would be released because we are going to we are going to make sure that no terror group ever runs the Gaza Strip again. However, also Harris was known uh, in, in this meeting with Netanyahu after, first of all, he spent uh, some four hours with first U.S. President Joe Biden and then met with Kamala Harris. Uh, and she really reemphasized uh, that importance of finding a solution. She also talked about uh, a, a possible two-state uh, solution uh, between Palestinians and Israelis. But it's really interesting how this scenario will unfold. Also, Israelis here, some Israeli experts uh, have took into Israelis, uh, Israeli uh, media saying that um, depending on, on her actions, it might actually undermine and underscore uh, the possibility of reaching a truce and being able to, to, to secure that deal and negotiation talks. At the same time, we don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, the elections are, are, are in November. We don't, a lot can happen for Israel until then in between uh, Hamas, uh, given also the fact that uh, a delegation is going uh, into Italy uh, for uh, both, both Hamas and Israel to, to continue uh, talks on a potential yet another ceasefire uh, talk for the release of hostages and a prisoner swap for Palestinian prisoners. Don? Hmm. Yeah, well, based on that uh, speech there in Congress, it looks like there could be potentially some different approaches there to the situation in Israel. Well, Diana Skaya reporting for us uh, live from Tel Aviv. Thank you for your report. Now, security lapses could threaten the safety of international communications in Europe. That's according to a recent investigation. Despite the war in Ukraine, a number of U European companies mapping infrastructure in the North Sea have continued to hire Russian technicians, giving them and potentially the Russian government access to sensitive data. Not long after the Nord Stream explosions, a Danish surveillance plane spotted a Russian supply vessel in the Baltic Sea, sailing close to the blast sites. The boat is thought to be part of Moscow's fleet of spy ships, masking as commercial carriers while conducting seabed mapping and other surveillance operations. The West woke up to the vulnerability of undersea infrastructure. 95% of global internet traffic is carried via undersea cables, and they support 10 trillion dollars of trade transactions each day. Now, work by the Follow the Money investigative site and the Belgian news outlet Tegidid has found that European companies mapping infrastructure in the North Sea have continued to hire Russian technicians, giving them, and potentially the Russian government, access to sensitive data. The probe has highlighted previously unrecognized vulnerabilities. While vigilance has increased, a number of countries are conducting risk assessments to better understand where potential threats may lie. Polish uniformed services will now be able to use firearms against dangerous or aggressive individuals along the frontier with Belarus, with little limitations. The Polish parliament agreed on the final set of rules of engagement for the Polish army and border guard when responding to incidents along the Poland-Belarus border. The new bill, soon to be passed by the Polish parliament, allows the Polish soldiers, police officers and border guards to use firearms if they feel like their lives and health are threatened. The changes come after an aggressive migrant stabbed a Polish soldier at the border last month. The soldier later died of his wounds. We are observing aggressive behaviors from the migrants all the time. They are throwing sticks and stones at our soldiers. The migrants have been storming the Polish border on and off for the past three years. All evidence says these attacks are being orchestrated by the Belarusian regime of Alexander Lukashenko. 
obserwujemy pewną tendencję spadkową. The numbers are slowly going down. Yesterday there were about 20 illegal attempts at crossing the border. The day before it was 70. It is certainly helped by the buffer zone put in place last month. Z pewnością wpływ na to ma According to Polish Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski, the numbers are also going down due to Poland's recent diplomatic efforts. Indeed, the Council of Ministers at my request asked the President to make the Chinese authorities aware, while in China, that the security of our Polish-Belarusian border is in China's interest. One such interest could be the fact that one of Beijing's major railway trade routes to Europe passes through Belarus and Poland. The closing of the so-called New Silk Road could have huge consequences for the Chinese exports. The bill has gathered some controversies, especially from some members of the parliament from the left and uh, some civil societies in Poland, saying that now the border guard and the army and the police will be able to act with impunity at the Polish border. But the majority of the parliament says that uh, the Polish uniformed services have the right to defend themselves against the attacks made by the Middle Eastern migrants and the officers of the Belarusian regime. From Warsaw, TVP World, Kazimierz Łysiak. After Brexit and the strained relations between the UK and the EU, reports are surfacing that there may be a breakthrough in relations. As a new Labour government took over in Britain, a whole host of issues could be cleared up. Reports are surfacing that an agreement coming out of Berlin could shore up defence cooperation and cover a vast range of issues from regulations on chemicals and professional qualifications to Erasmus Student Exchange Program. Here's more. It was a busy week for Britain's new Defence Secretary, John Healy. He was welcomed to Warsaw by his Polish counterpart, Władysław kosiniak kamysz on his first international trip. Healy brought pledges of support for the construction of Poland's East Shield project to protect the EU's eastern border and hope of closer cooperation between Britain and the European Union. Hours earlier on Wednesday, Healy signed a deal in Berlin to strengthen defence industries, reinforce European security and support Ukraine in the war with Russia. London's new government wants closer ties with the EU. UK and EU as, uh, are like this old couple that uh, uh, that got divorced and it was a dramatic divorce. And right now, after a couple of years, they are sitting together and they are finding out that they have some unresolved issues and they simply need to talk to one another. And this is what's going on right now with this new government in Britain. It now appears that there's more to this than just warm words. The Politico news site reports that Berlin is proposing what it calls a Brexit mega deal that will help Britain reset relations with the EU after the turbulent years of previous Conservative governments. There's good reason to talk about common goals rather than differences. Right now we have the world outside, right? There's a war in Ukraine, uh, there's, uh, there's some elections on the other, other side of the pond um, in the US. So all those questions are very important for us to talk with each other. And uh, this is why this EU-UK uh, cooperation, especially uh, about security issues, this is super important for both sides. Officials say a bilateral UK-EU summit may be held early next year. In the face of Russia's war in Ukraine and concerns over America's presidential election, expect a lot more talk by Britain and the EU about unity. The 2024 Summer Olympic Games kicked off in Paris. This year's Games will feature 329 events in 32 sports with 206 Olympic national teams represented. Among them, of course, is Poland. Now joining me here to discuss what we can expect at this year's Summer Olympics and how Poland is expected to fare is Piotr Sobczynski from TVP Sport. Hello and thanks for joining us tonight on World News Tonight. Good evening. Now, although the games are officially underway, the opening ceremony started today at 7 o'clock p.m. Um, and it won't be in a stadium or it's not taking place inside of a stadium. So why the late start and what's so different about these opening ceremonies? Uh, 
<clears throat> the opening ceremony is currently going on in Paris, just in, in the very middle of, of the city center along the Seine River. Uh, and it's impressive. It's different from all we've seen so far uh, because it's not uh, in the stadium. There's a lot of art, a lot of symbolic, and I'm trying to watch it as I talk to you because it's still on the way. And it's combined with a parade of athletes, uh, not in the stadium, not in the track, but uh, based on boats and uh, flowing along the Seine River. Uh, so it's just different, and the French have this tendency to make it their own way. Uh, maybe some of you remember the opening from Albeville, the Winter Olympic Games in 1992. It was different as well, although although restricted to the stadium area. Now it's even bigger, uh, it's more inventive, it's very interesting to watch. And uh, the games, well, the games are going to be interesting as all Olympic games because of the level of competition. And mm, we, I mean, the Polish national team, uh, we have a target set at at least 14 medals. Uh, that's the number we managed to win in Tokyo three years ago. Um, let's hope that it's, 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 it's going to be achieved this time as well. Yeah, if let's we hope exceed, we can improve on it. Uh, if we, yeah, if we, if we improve on it, we exceed that number, uh, it's going to be announced as a great success. Right now, with every new Olympics, usually there's uh, some kind of new event that makes its way into the competition. This year, it's breakdancing. Uh, so how will this event be organized, and uh, who are the favorites in the breakdancing yeah, competition? Say, hard to say uh, who, who the favorites are. Now, the breakdancing, along some other uh, city sports, uh, urban sports, uh, is going to take place right in the center of Paris, in the uh, Place de la Concorde. And um, there's going to be performed alongside uh, the so-called street ball, three-on-three -three basketball, and I think uh, something else as well. So three three venues next to each other in in, in that iconic place in Paris. Um, you know, I've I've read uh, a bit about breaking. That that's how it's officially called. And uh, it was hard to persuade the, the real stars of breaking to compete in the Olympic Games. It is supposed to attract the young people's attention. It's supposed to be urban and um, quite new, but uh, it's also uh, it's also hard to say if it's going to be performed at the topmost level this time. Right. Yeah. A lot like I remember when uh, skateboarding made the scenes. Right. Um, some say that pole dancing should be included into the Olympics. Uh, how likely is that to become a reality? Oh, it's all up to the IOC. Uh, they have to analyze the, the reach of the sports, uh, you know, in the global level. Uh, but uh, let me remind you that uh, throughout the history of the Olympic sports, there were many disciplines uh, that seemed more or less strange uh, or seemed strange to us and they were they were just dropped uh, after one or two uh, performances uh, during during the course of the olympic history so it's nothing new and the ioc is, is looking for new things uh, to attract attention and if something catches uh, uh, it will just be kept kept on but there are there are also disciplines that uh, come and go like baseball and softball that just depends on the popularity in the host nation. They, they were played in, um, in Japan last time and they're going to be played in um, Los Angeles in four years time, but I don't think they're, they're present in Paris now. Huh, interesting, interesting. So a little bit of continuity, uh, if they're willing. I imagine the French aren't too keen on baseball or, or on no. softball. Um, no. Well, the Olympics never or rarely go without controversy. This year, there's much being said about the, well, the opening ceremony, as we talked about, security threats, a hijab ban, um, smear campaigns, and the participation of nations involved in wars. Now, you're somebody that's covered the Olympics uh, several times. You're in the world of sport all the time. Uh, so what do you think are the most uh, notable, I think, controversies this year around um, so far? 
at the Paris Olympic Games. No, I think number one issue is um, disallowing the Russian and Belarusian athletes from competing. I mean, some of them will be present, but uh, only a minority, and uh, that's for a just cause. And I, I totally support the IOC's decision uh, not to allow the Russians to take part in the Olympics while there's uh, an all-out war going on in Ukraine. Uh, so that that's number one controversy. There are a number of other ones, as always, in the Olympics. I mean, who should be allowed, who should not. Um, there are a number of um, last-minute disqualifications, some doping issues. Um, what else? Uh, but, you know, the, the Olympics are still alive. And uh, they, they just focus the attention of the entire world uh, these days. So uh, apart from the controversy, apart from the security issues that are always present, apart from the great effort from the hosting nation uh, to, to handle all those matters, uh, they are going to you know, hit um, magic audience figures very high and very vast. Right, with the Russians being out, because the Russians usually perform quite well in the Olympics, uh, how is that going to affect the, the, the medal count? Uh, well, do you think that... In some way, mm -hmm. in some way, of course. Um, I mean, certainly some medals will not be won uh, by the Russians, and so, so some other nations may benefit from that. Uh, and so uh, we know it very well. We know how it tastes, because um, in recent years, for example, in ice hockey, uh, when the Russian team was not allowed to participate in the World Championships, uh, it was easier for us uh, to qualify, at least for one time, uh, to the A-level uh, World Championships. Uh, so definitely, uh, definitely it's going to be easier for some nations to win medals, uh, which is good, which is good. And, um, uh, right, so I'm, I'm just trying to... Yeah, trying to keep Have two things going at once. All right, let me, going on in Paris. let me drop the big question on you, and that is, of course, what are you expecting for Poland? Uh, last time, as you mentioned, uh, what was it, 14 medals, I believe, placed 17th overall. We had four golds, five silver, and five bronze medals. So which areas should we be looking out uh, for Polish golds, bronze, and silver medals? You know, uh, in Tokyo, we, we just... Uh, fared astonishingly well in athletics and uh, you, you can't expect uh, you know th this medal count to repeat each time so um, there will there will be I'm sure so some um, athletic medals in uh, this time but not as many and um, there will there will also be some surprise medals I'm sure um, well, being optimistic, uh, I can say, um, I mean, without without exact counting, I mean, I'm not very much into this method, uh, but I would say we'll just keep the level uh, we Maintain. got to. Yeah, yeah, we got to in Tokyo. Um, hard to predict if we're going to exceed uh, above that level. Uh, but judging from the results we, we got in, in international competition um, in you know, different sports, uh, it's going to be hard. You know, there's, there's certainly, you know, the, there are sports that we focus on and that we especially uh, expect the medals from, like volleyball, mm -hmm. because uh, we've got two teams, men's and women's team, uh, for the first time since uh, 2008. And uh, the men's team is definitely one of the best in the world. And they, they just can't do it in the Olympics. Uh, I mean, five quarterfinals, five times in, uh, you know, running uh, without winning a medal. So everybody hopes it's the time uh, to, to break this curse. Yeah, we'll be crossing our fingers or uh, holding our thumbs, as we say in Poland now. Um, Final question, what are some of the events um, that even a modest spectator should definitely not miss in these upcoming Olympics? Um, 
I, I cannot be uh, an unbiased judge because uh, obviously there are sports that I like more than the others. So the, the definite must-see for me is the um, basketball tournament with the Americans defending the gold medal and uh, with this margin between them and the rest of the world still narrowing. Uh, they were able to defend the Olympic gold. Um, the last time they didn't was 2004, so 20 years ago. Uh, and since then, the redemption came and they, they keep it firmly in their hands. So let, let's see that. Uh, let's see if that happens again. And of course, uh, because I'm a basketball fan, uh, I'm going to watch the three on three tournament in the city center in Paris in the Place de la Concorde with the Polish team three on three. Uh, seeking their second chance because they were also present in Tokyo uh, and they didn't manage uh, to uh, go as high as they wanted to. So now when there's a second chance, let's see what happens. Yep, we will see what happens. It's just getting underway. Well, we'll let you get back to work. Piotr Sobczynski from TVP Sport, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And that concludes this edition of World News Tonight. You can check out the Olympics because we have quite a bit of time to go and a lot of events to cover. Thanks for watching and see you next time.